chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we gather around your word this morning, Lord, we pray that your word would, would penetrate us, would challenge us, would give us hope, would point us to the truth of the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are finishing up our look at the Beatitudes today. Um, we have spent the past seven weeks before this week uh, looking at, at each, of, uh, each of the Beatitudes as Jesus gives them in the, the book of Matthew. And today we are on the, we're looking at the final one. Um, and, uh, well, Jesus, he sure knows how to end on a high note, doesn't he? Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. What an ending. And then if that's not enough, Jesus has the audacity to follow that up with a command. So rejoice and be glad. This is quite an ending uh, to our series on the Beatitudes. But because this is the last sermon in this series, I want us to start by stepping back a minute again. Stepping back so we can again look at kind of the big picture of these Beatitudes. So I want you to imagine uh, that you have not heard this scripture read over the past couple months every week in church. And just imagine that you're one of those disciples that has followed Jesus, has been following Jesus around, and now you've followed him up onto that mountain, and you sit down as he begins to teach, and you're anxiously awaiting, what is he going to say? So you're listening as he begins, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you're thinking, so far so good. That's a, pre that's a pretty catchy way to, to begin a sermon, right? And then he goes on. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And now even blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, so far you're listening. And you've noticed there's some tough stuff in here that Jesus is talking about, but there's also fantastic promises. And anyway, you're thinking at this point, anyway, good for them, all those people who are poor in spirit, who are mourning and persecuted and all that stuff, good for them, you think to yourself, those people need those promises. And then it happens. Right there towards the end, Jesus shifts things around, and he looks right at you and the rest of the, the, rest of the disciples, and he says, blessed are you, Suddenly, he's not just talking about those people. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. And he says, blessed are you 
when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you, blessed are you. Suddenly things just got real, didn't they? See, what Jesus is doing here is he starts off and he's drawing us in. And then he gives that big twist at the end, right? That big twist at the end of the movie that changes the perspective of everything. He's been describing not abstract people out there, but who you and all those who follow him are going to become. He's describing what following him is going to lead to and what it's going to be like in his kingdom. And he ends by saying, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you who are persecuted on my account. Now, if you're like me, you'd be left thinking to yourself, wait a second. Those other promises, those first promises and those earlier Beatitudes, they sounded pretty good. But this is also what it's like to follow Jesus? Well, as it turns out, for many of the disciples that were there listening, yes, that's exactly how it turned out. Many of them were persecuted for their faith. And many in the early centuries of the church were persecuted, and people spread rumors about them and slandered them. False rumors were spread. There are places where that has happened to Christians throughout the centuries. And the fact is that still happens today. But you know, for the most part, not here. At least not in the same way. And if it does, let's be honest, it's pretty tame compared to a lot of the history of the church and a lot of what goes on in other parts of the country or in the, in the world, excuse me. You know, the fact is, personally, I don't really know what persecution is like. There are certainly people in the world who do, but I'm not one of them. I mean, I've been teased, but I don't know that I've ever been reviled or had people say evil things about me. And if that has happened, to be honest, I'm really not sure it was because of righteousness or, or on Jesus' account. It was more likely because, well, because I was probably being a jerk <laughs> or a little bit selfish or prideful or something like that. No, I've actually lived a pretty persecution-free life. And I suspect that's true for most of us here, really, when we think about it. And the reality is, I don't know, as I, as I was wrestling with this beatitude, this closing of the beatitudes, I don't know if that makes it harder for me to preach about this text, or maybe, to be honest, maybe it makes it way too easy to stand up here and say, blessed are the persecuted. I don't know. But here's what I do know. If we take Jesus seriously, if we take him at his word, there are a few, few things here that we can be certain about. And the first is that if we do come across something that feels like we're being persecuted, we need to ask God to help us discern why. Is it because of Jesus? Or is it because we are not living out the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control that the Apostle Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit? Because Jesus is very clear here about what type of persecution he's talking about, isn't he? And it's not being persecuted or talked about or reviled because, because we're being unkind or harsh or anything like that. It's in fact because we're following Jesus to the opposite of those things, to the fruit of the Spirit. That's the kind of persecution Jesus is talking about. So we need to be careful about when we think we're being persecuted and ask God, Am I really being persecuted because of you? Or is there something going on in me? That's the first thing this passage should remind us to do. And the second thing is that we shouldn't be surprised that something like this might happen. Now that doesn't mean that we should seek it out or that persecution is a good thing. We should stand up for people when they are persecuted, whoever they are. And we should speak out against it. We should work against persecution any form. But if it happens, it shouldn't surprise us. Because Jesus said, follow me. And by the way, things might get tough. 
Because he's calling us to live out a, a life of faith that is, that is often in opposition to the idolatry and the fear and the anger that fuels a lot of the world that we live in. It is all too easy to get wrapped up in the types of security and hope that the world looks to at the expense of the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, and so on. And so when you're following Jesus, when you know you belong to his kingdom, to that place of all comfort and mercy and fullness and grace, that grace that's, that's the only reason that you belong to that kingdom in the first place, when you know that, of course there's going to be times and places where you will be opposed to what's going on in the world, and the way the world's going about its business. When you know that, there's going to be those times when you have to say, no, I know who I am and to whom I belong, and the king and the kingdom that I belong to do not operate in this way. And when you do that, of course there's going to be pushback. Jesus is talking about being persecuted and having people say evil, false things about you because of him. Because your faith, your trust is in him and not in the safety and security that the world offers. But it's in who he is. And it's in what he has done on your behalf. And what did Jesus do? Well, he went out of his way to make himself poor in spirit to stand with those who mourn, himself mourn alongside of them. He went out of his way to be meek, to know what it's like to hunger and thirst, to be merciful, and yet remain pure in heart. And Jesus came, as we talked about um, last time, Jesus came to be our peace, and he was persecuted for it. Well, therefore, if these Beatitudes are in the context, if these Beatitudes are really about what it's like to follow Jesus, then the answer they give is that, is that what it is like to follow him is to become like him. That's what the Beatitudes promise us, that through faith and trust in him, our lives actually become, become hidden in his. We become identified with him. His promises and our hope become wrapped up in his very life. Because all of the promises of these Beatitudes, they're the promises of the kingdom, and they are fulfilled in Jesus. And so the ultimate promise that we get from these Beatitudes is that through him, through Jesus, we are made to be more and more like him. And this, these Beatitudes, this is what that looks like. And so here in this world, there may be trouble. Faith in Christ may lead to conflict because it brings out, that faith in Christ, it brings out questions of authority and allegiance, of hope and security, and of whose promises you really trust. That conflict, that's where it led Jesus. And for those of us who seek to follow him, it might very well be where it leads us to. But the good news, the good news that that wasn't the end of the story for Jesus, was it? And so if your life is wrapped up in his, like these Beatitudes promise us, and if his faith is your fate, it's not the end of the story for you either. Because the end of the story is that those who mourn will be comforted. Those who are meek are in line for their heavenly Father's inheritance. Those who hunger and thirst will be filled. Mercy will overflow. God and the fulfillment of his work of redemption will be seen, and it will be made known, and we will stand secure in the kingdom because we will be called children of the king. That is the promise of these Beatitudes. That is the promise of the gospel. Family, that is the promise of Jesus himself. That, that this promise that, that the present reality that they speak of and the future hope that they point to, those two things come together and they meet in the person of Jesus Christ. Family, plain and simple, that is the gospel. That Jesus brought the kingdom by becoming poor in spirit. We receive comfort because he mourned over his people. We share in his inheritance because he became meek. 
We are filled with his righteousness because he emptied himself. Through his mercy, we are changed and we begin to see and know God more clearly and more deeply because of his mercy. Because he has made peace between us and God, he is also our peace between each other as he is making for himself a one new family of God. And because he faced the persecution of the cross, he conquered sin and death. And so he brings us a kingdom that will not and cannot end. Family, these beatitudes, they are nothing short of the very promise of the gospel. And it's faith in that. It's trust in that promise. And in that reality of Jesus and who he is, that aligns us first and foremost with him, but then also, and he alludes to this in the, in the last verse that we read, it also puts us in the company of the prophets, and by extension, all of God's people. It's that great cloud of witnesses that the book of Hebrews says surrounds us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, therefore, Jesus says, Rejoice and be glad, because you are in fantastic company. Why? Because you're being persecuted? No. Rejoice and be glad, because even if you are persecuted, even if people make up lies about you because of him, still rejoice and be glad, because you are caught up in the very life of Christ, and you stand in the company of not just him, but also your great extended family, that extended family that crosses all barriers of time and space. And your father is the king, and his kingdom knows no end. So rejoice, be glad, because you, brothers and sisters, you are identified with Christ. You know, earlier in the worship service, we used these Beatitudes as our prayer of confession. Um, we did that because the type of life that they call us to is something that we're not always very good at. It's a challenge that we fall short of. But here's the good news. The good news is that you and I, we are not meant to be the heroes of these Beatitudes. Because Jesus is the hero of this story. Jesus has fulfilled them perfectly so that you and I and all who would follow him through his grace and his mercy, so that we can live lives that don't ignore the challenge of the Beatitudes, but that begin to reflect them, begin to proclaim them more and more, to proclaim their hopes and their promise. That our lives, the words we speak, the way we come alongside the poor in spirit, mourning and the meek, the hungry and the thirsty, the way our words and our acts of mercy and grace, our commitment to peacemaking, the way we follow Jesus into his kingdom, and we promise here is that our lives can proclaim to the world the good news that Jesus is the hero of this story, and they can point to the kingdom he brings. It's a kingdom that can flip this world upside down. Because in him, in Jesus, the realities of this world meet the reality of the hope and the promise of the kingdom of heaven. That one day, because of the work Christ has already done, he will come and bring his kingdom in all its fullness and its mercy and its comfort and peace. Family, that is his promise. That is the promise of the Beatitudes. That he spoke. So in the meantime, family, let us live into the promise of these Beatitudes. Let us live out their promise. Family, proclaim this promise in your words and with your actions. And above all, above all, know to whom you belong and rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. Amen.